Hi everybody and thanks for joining us for our webinar today called Photoacoustic Molecular Imaging of Breast Cancer Using Antibody Dye Contrast Agents. My name is Drew Heinmiller. I'm a product manager here at Fujifilm Visual Sonics and our guest today is Dr. Katie Wilson uh, from Stanford University. Before Katie uh, gets going, <clears throat> a couple of notes to start first. Uh, we will be making a recording of this webinar available uh, a few days after this broadcast. Um, all of your lines will be muted for the duration of the webinar, but if you'd like to ask questions, uh, please do so through the questions panel uh, at any time during the presentation, and we'll take those questions at the end of the session. So we're going to have a short, uh, it should be about 45 minute presentation, and then we'll do about 10 or 15 minutes of questions at the end. I'm going to give a sh short introduction of, of Dr. Wilson. Um, she received her undergraduate degree uh, degrees, I should say, in biomedical engineering from the University of Washington and the University of uh, Texas at Austin. Uh, and she's pursued advanced postdoctoral studies at Stanford since in the Department of Radiology. And she recently received an NIH K99 Transition to Faculty Award. Uh, with that, Katie's been uh, using our system for a long time. She's done some great work, some great publications. I'm really excited about the data that she's going to be sharing with you today. Uh, so it's my pleasure to hand it over uh, to Dr. Katie Wilson. Hi, uh, thanks so much, Drew. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here um, this morning or this afternoon, depending where you are, talking to you about uh, photoacoustic molecular imaging of breast cancer using our antibody dye contrast agents. Um, this is a recently published work of ours, and I think it really highlights the um, ability of photoacoustic imaging for molecular imaging specifically. So uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is a great methodology for basically any um, disease model or cancer model. Um, specifically, I'm going to be focusing on breast cancer, but I think everything that I do here is highly applicable to other um, diseases, so keep that in mind as, as we're going through. So breast cancer. In 2017, there's going to be over 250,000 new cases and 40,000 new uh, or and 40,000 deaths from this disease. Um, and but we know that the five-year survival rate for women with uh, stage zero or, or very early disease is close to 100%. However, if we uh, diagnose at the later stage, uh, the survival rate is very low. And so we know that early detection is key. And so currently. Um, there are a lot of challenges in current breast cancer screening methodologies. We know that mammography is notoriously insensitive, uh, especially in patients with uh, dense breast tissue, uh, even as low as 30 percent. Um, and ultrasound is being shown to be able to increase the uh, cancer detection rates. However, ultrasound has a very low positive predictive value, meaning it has high sensitivity but very low specificity for detecting disease. And that means we're getting a, a, a lot of callbacks and biopsies, which is putting a lot of cost uh, in the medical and, and stress on the medical care system and on the women that are undergoing these treatments. And thus, we really need a way to non-invasively differentiate uh, benign from malignant disease on ultrasound imaging. And photoacoustic uh, imaging and also fluorescence imaging um, are, are, could be a key or could be a, a great application for these because of, there's low ultrasound scattering and it's a relatively superficial nature of the tissue. So um, let me just briefly introduce, introduce uh, photoacoustic imaging in case anybody's not familiar with it. Um, so photoacoustic imaging is um, very complementary to ultrasound. It's, it's light in, sound out, however, and so you're going to irradiate some sort of photoabsorber with pulsed laser radiation. Uh, this photoabsorber is going to absorb that light and emit heat, and that causes a, a rapid expansion, um, which then contracts, releasing acoustic transients. So these, these um, acoustic signals can be reconstructed very similarly to ultrasound, um, and so therefore can use standard ultrasound uh, equipment uh, and transducers to reconstruct the, these images. So a lot of the endogenous photoabsorbers that we can image include things like melanin, uh, hemoglobin, uh, deoxidated and oxygenated hemoglobin, um, water to some extent, and lipid as well. And just uh, for a sample image, you can see that ultrasound is very good at giving you the anatomy of, of in this case, a subcutaneous tumor, um, but a photoacoustic image, which is going to give you the, um, the optical absorption properties of the tissue, uh, is, is very different than that of the ultrasound, but together they're very complementary. 
So photoacoustic signal, um, the peak pressure uh, generated is going to be proportional to, this is kind of oversimplified, but uh, um, proportional to a Grunizen parameter, uh, the fluence or the, the laser energy at that photoabsorber and the optical absorption coefficient of, of the photoabsorber. Um, this is kind of makes some assumptions. Um, First of all, we generally hold the Grunism parameter fairly constant in watery tissues. However, it is a little bit different um, in fat. Uh, basically, this parameter describes you know, heat capacitance, thermal expansion coefficients, and density, things like that. Um, so because we know that the optical absorption uh, vary, of various chromophores varies over wavelength, we can do a, a spectroscopic photoacoustic technique. So um, Multiple wavelengths are used to collect photoacoustic image, uh, images, and then we can actually unmix the photoacoustic signal um, through statistics to, to correlate signal to individual uh, absorbers instead of a bulk uh, photoacoustic signal. Um, so this was the photoacoustic, how do we do this? This is the photoacoustic signal that um, equation that I just uh, showed you. Uh, we know that the optical absorption is uh, wavelength dependent uh, and has, you know, a, a number of absorbers in there as well. So we can separate this out into um, a, a separate optical absorption coefficients dependent on wavelength. We know that the optical absorption coefficient uh, is same at, or is the concentration of the absorber, absorber times the molar absorption cross section, and therefore we can. Um, you know, expand our equation as such. So now we need to solve this equation. Generally, if you, um, you know, set up your equation right and you are Im imaging superficially and you've calibrated your machine for fluence, you can generally hold the fluence um, constant. So that simplifies our equation a little bit further. And then we can set up um, a, a system of linear equations that we can solve for. So typically, we only examine a few chromophores, typically uh, um, oxidated and deoxidated hemoglobin, as well as maybe a contrast agent that you're looking at. Um, um, however, we can use a wide range of, of imaging wavelengths. So really, this ends up being an overdetermined set of linear equations. And therefore, we can use a linear least square error regression to find the best fit. Uh, this can be accomplished through uh, using a more Penrose pseudo inverse. Um, and the nice thing is that um, this gives us the rel kind of the relative concentrations within the tissues of these chromophores. And really, this can uh, be implemented in just a few lines of, of code in MATLAB. So it's a fairly straightforward method of, of solving for this, for the uh, relative concentrations of these photos or the tissue. So spectroscopic photoacoustic imaging. Um, is typically used to look at endogenous photoabsorbers, um, and the nice thing um, is the that hemoglobin um, do, you know dominates our signal, and it's and we can use this to look at oxygen and deoxygenated hemoglobin, giving us oxygen saturation. So these these are these are um, applications that don't require any contrast agents and make photoacoustics really readily clinically translatable. Um, you have to have some a priori knowledge of what those optical absorption uh, cove efficient spectra look like to be able to do this technique, which in some cases is very easy. In other cases, as you'll see in a second, is a little more difficult. Um, however, if you want to look at other molecular information, such as cell surface markers, et cetera, you're going to require a contrast agent to um, examine that. So currently, photoacoustic contrast agents, there's a, a wide range of what is being used currently. Basically, anything that, that absorbs light <laughs> efficiently can be used as a photoacoustic contrast agent. Typically, um, uh, nanoparticles, gold nanoparticles or, or um, noble metal nanoparticles have been very popular because of very high absorption. Um, and however, you know, tumor accumulation is generally poor for most agents. Um, and dyes are a little interesting as well because a lot of them are clinically approved already to be used, but they have really rapid clearance. So, you know, a lot of people have been working to try and, and optimize these contrast agents um, uh, for, to, to kind of cut down on their, on their negative aspects and enhance their positive aspects. And so 
What we really want to know is, can we use photoacoustic imaging to track and map some molecular interactions at a cellular level in vivo? And that's, that was our goal of, of this project. Um, and it was recently published uh, here in Theranostics this year. So if you want more details, you can look there. So in this, in this project, we really wanted to overcome the limitations of using dyes, um, uh, such as the rapid clearance um, and no molecular specificity by conjugating it to an antibody. So antibodies have an incredibly long blood half-life for most things, um, some up to two or three weeks, um, a very high molecular specificity, and they're already clinically used as well. So both components of this agent are clinically used. Um, and, and combined, they kind of overcome each other's limitations, if that makes sense. Um, antibody ICG uh, agents are not particularly uh, novel. They have been used in fluorescence imaging for a long time uh, in the intraoperative um, scene. Um, but there's something very interesting about ICG that um, we're hoping we can take advantage of. So indocyanin green has optical absorption that changes drastically based on a multitude of factors, including concentration and whether or not it's uh, bound to a protein or its environment. Um, and just as a couple examples, you can see the range of absorption spectrum that ICG can, can take. And so we saw this and we really saw an opportunity and said, can we leverage these changes in optical absorption spectrum to, to determine molecular binding and internalization and degradation of these antibody ICG contrast agents? So we know that antibodies um, based up their, uh, if they're specific antibodies or maybe a non-specific antibody, they, they interact differently in the cells. And so we used confocal microscopy uh, to examine the intracellular fates of a specific antibody ICG agent versus a non-specific, just an isotype agent. Um, and if you look here, both the uh, isotype uh, agent and the specific agent er, uh, enter early endosomes, um, as, which are highlighted by green here. But you can see that only the specific antibody ICG, or in this case it's an alexyl fluoride, um, enter into the lysosomes. So this pathway, endosomes to lysosomes, um, represents a degradation pathway. Whereas an isotype antibody enters lysosomes or enters endosomes, but does not enter lysosomes, um, which is significant of a recycling pathway. So these enter the cells and then are recycled back out. And this is one of the mechanisms uh, of which antibodies have such a large um, half-life is because they're effectively just recycled uh, in and out of cells to circulate longer. Um, and so we really want to take advantage of the differences here and the degradation that occurs here versus the recycling to, to be able to track molecular uh, uh, interactions. So we've recently done a lot of work looking at the B7H3 marker um, in breast cancer. So we, we actually looked at about 280 samples, human samples, consisting of normal tissues, 11 subtypes of benign lesions, and then the four most common malignant um, subtypes as well. And we were actually able to show that the B7H3 marker is highly specific to cancerous lesions. Uh, with an area under the curve of 0.93 to differentiate between the um, cancer versus normal benign lesions. And furthermore, this protein is also expressed on not only the endothelial cells, but also the epithelial cells. So this gives us a multitude of binding sites for our antibody to attach and, and be internalized to. So this, this looks like a great target for us to use. So this is the general strategy of the project here. Basically, we're going to inject our B7H3 uh, ICG conjugate into an animal, allow it to circulate. Uh, as, this, as this agent binds to its cell surface markers, it's going to be internalized. And you can see here that the, the little ICGs are changing colors. That's significant of their shift in, in absorption spectrum. And then we can use spectroscopic photoacoustic imaging at different wavelengths. Um, to hopefully uh, differentiate between the intact and the degraded um, agent, giving us a, a map of where our molecular interactions between our contrast agent and our cancer cells are actually happening. So in this, in this study, we used a murine model. It's a transgenic murine model of breast cancer development, so it spontaneously develops breast cancer, and it actually progresses through the disease stages very similarly to how a human would, um, starting at a hyperplasia and then a DCIS and followed eventually by an invasive carcinoma. And this happens in a fairly predictable age-dependent manner. 
So by um, you know six to seven weeks, most of these um, mice have um, significant disease within their mammary glands. For, furthermore, mice have 10 mammary glands per animal, and um, and each mammary gland this happens independently, which is kind of an interesting way. So you get a dose controlled um, subject that has a, a, an n of 10. It's it's a very great model. And of course, we wanted to show that our, our Murray model uh, expresses the V7H3 marker just as well as human tissues do. And so we did some immunofluorescent staining. And you can see that in normal mammary tissues, there's very limited, if any, V7H3 expression, whereas in an invasive mammary tumor, there's just extensive V7H3. So this seems to follow very well with our human data. So the V7H3 ICG synthesis is very straightforward. Um, there are ICG uh, and uh, NHS esters available commercially, so this is this is something you can purchase, um, and it's mixed directly with the antibody. Um, if you you know you can just incubate it; it's very rapid for an hour, and then you pur purify and you can concentrate, and it's ready to go. So this is a very straightforward um, um, synthesis method as well. To characterize our B7H3, um, we did a lot of actually fairly detailed work here. We looked at the optical absorption um, with the spectrophotometer um, in both the dye alone, the dye with the um, antibody, and then also this um, B7H3 ICG plus SDS. This, this allows the dye to be within an unquenched state. Um, and so you can see even just, you know, on the bench top, we can get a large shift in our optical absorption spectrum, and that holds for the isotype antibody uh, and dye as well. Then to determine the um, ratio of, of dyes to per antibody, we did um, uh, mass spec. And you can see this is the, this is the uh, mass spec of the antibody by itself. And it's very nice. And then as soon as you throw on some ICG, you can see that the mass increases. And this is corresponding to about uh, seven to eight ICG dyes per antibody. And then finally, we just wanted to make sure that attaching all these ICG molecules to these antibodies does not affect their ability to bind to their specific target. And so using some flow cytometry, um, we were able to show that the um, specific antibody was still able to bind to its, its receptor protein as compared, and then an isotype um, obviously does not bind. So overall, this is a pretty well characterized antibody. It seems to retain its functionality, um, and I think it is ready to go. So now, like I said before, when you're going to do a spectroscopic photoacoustic technique, you have to, at least um, with the current methods, you have to have some sort of a priori knowledge of what kind of, uh, of the optical absorption properties that you're going to feed into your spectroscopic um, algorithm. Uh, however, I also just showed you that ICG has, um, you know, drastically varying optical absorption spectrum depending on its condition, and we really had no idea what uh, optical absorption spectrum to use uh, to try and get the best kind of, of, of uh, photo, uh, spectroscopic reconstruction of the molecular signal itself. And so we did kind of this elaborate uh, in vitro, in vivo experiment. Uh, to try and elucidate that reference spectrum that we needed to use for our algorithm. So um, how we did this, we used uh, MS1 uh, cells that were stably transfected to express B7H3. So this is a, a strong overexpression of B7H3 in these cells. And we actually incubated either um, isotype ICG or the specific B7H3 ICG with these cells for 24 hours. Then we rinsed them very well, collected them, mixed them with a little bit of colorless major gel, and injected them uh, subcutaneously on the flank of a mouse here. Um, and you can see, first we um, wanted to also show the fluorescence imaging, because ICG is also fluorescent, so that's, that's a nice um, uh, co-imaging technique here. And if you look at just the fluorescence imaging of, of what this looks like, you can see that, first of all, is the isotype ICG is just not endocytosed as much as the specific antibody, and that's to be expected. Um, and we had six different um, concentrations coming down the side of the animal here. So if you look at the fluorescence intensity, um, radiant efficiency, you can see that fluorescence, of course, has a very high sensitivity, which is one of the, one of the great aspects of fluorescence, um, and can detect down to the 13 nanomolar um, concentration of ICG uh, on the animal. However, if you look at the photoacoustic, uh, like a single wavelength, uh, this is an 800 nanometers photoacoustic raw signal intensity, um, actually you can't 
quite detect. You can only detect the two highest concentrations here up on the top of the mouse um, using photoacoustics, um, a single wavelength um, a method. And so this really highlights the need to do a spectroscopic uh, um, you know, extraction of molecular information to, to really increase the sensitivity of photoacoustic imaging. Um, and so, as I said, we need to determine that reference spectrum. And so what we actually did is we plotted the photoacoustic signal intensity um, over wavelength inside each of those inclusions um, or the inclusion of the highest concentration on, on the back of the animal. And that produced these um, optical absorption reference spectrums. So you can see both uh, the isotype and the B7H3 um, ICGs before have a very similar spectrum shown in this green, but after 24 hours of incubation, you can see that the um, specific antibody and the isotype antibody shown in blue and red respectively have significantly different absorption spectrum. These are normalized, so um, they might, the, the widths are probably a little off, but the peaks are very different. And so if we use the blue spectrum here now as our specific uh, antibody ICG spectrum, we can uh, use, use that with our spectroscopic algorithm and actually extract the molecular imaging um, signal. So not only can we see with photoacoustic imaging now, not only can we see the highest concentration, but we can now also see the signal coming from the lowest concentration inoculation, the 13.3 nanomolar concentration. So um, not only are we getting the sensitivity now, but if we look at the um, inoculations using the isotype ICG, we, we suppress any nonspecific signal in the highest concentration and also in the lowest one. And just to quantify that, you can now see this, this curve, this is photoacoustic molecular imaging signal. This curve now looks a lot like the fluorescent signal that we sh I showed previously, and we can get really down into those lowest concentrations. So using a spectroscopic algorithm to extract uh, you know, a chromophore of interest can really increase the sensitiv sensitivity of photoacoustic imaging and also gives you a very nice specificity as well. And the interesting thing to note is these were the um, optical absorption spectrum of the antibody ICG um, just collected on a, on a spectrophotometer. And while you can see that the, they're relatively similar, this is, the bef this is before, you know, an incubation, and this would be what you'd consider after an incubation here. Um, they're, they're still different, and so I think it's interesting to note that, you know, really we had to look at the, an in vivo situation to determine an optimal reference spectrum for this, for this use case. So next we moved to our in vivo imaging. Um, like I said, we used this murine model of breast cancer development. Um, we use them when they're about 10 to 12 weeks of age, meaning that all mammary glands uh, contain invasive carcinomas. Um, we injected them intravenously with 33 micrograms of one of five conditions. So um, either the positive contrast agent with ICG, um, the isotype control agent, so the nonspecific agent. We did a blocking condition where 24 hours previously to the injection of the agent, we inject 100 micrograms of just the B7H3 antibody itself to try and block all those receptors. Um, we also looked at ICG die alone, and then finally we also looked at the positive agent in normal mice without tumors. We did fluorescence imaging, multi-wavelength photoacoustic imaging, and mode ultrasound at um, before, and then 24, 48, 72, and 96 hours after, so five imaging time points. And of course we use the visual sonics laser, and then we use the Zengen IVA spectrum for our fluorescence imaging. So let's start with the um, the imaging results of the positive agent and the positive agent in normal glands. So just our positive test condition and a very obviously negative test condition. And it's interesting to look at just the biodistribution of this agent um, in normal um, and mice and mice containing invasive carcinomas. So ICG is cleared through the hepatobiliary tract, so liver, gallbladder, and down into the large intestine. So you get a lot at the 24-hour um, time point here, you're getting a lot of background signal um, from liver and uh, bowel and gallbladder, et cetera. Um, and this is, this is going to be standard. Um, and just in case you're not familiar with mouse mammary anatomy. Um, mice have 10 mammary glands that are located on the periphery of the abdomen here, so you can use that as reference. Um, and you can see that in a normal mouse, um, this agent circulates and is cleared, and uh, out to 96 hours, we can still see a little bit of it being cleared, but there's no accumulation in any mammary glands or anywhere else. Um, and ultrasound uh, is 
uh, you know, shows normal memory glands. And of course, our SVA molecular um, imaging shows no signal as well. That's to be expected. So it's a little interesting now when we go to our positive test case here, you can see that this agent is now, according to fluorescence, um, collecting within our mammary glands. You can see them all the way out to 96 hours. And our ultrasound show, at this point, of course, shows um, some masses within our gland because these are larger, um, these are more invasive carcinomas at this point. And finally, our uh, molecular photoacoustic signal um, strongly shows our our RB7H3 ICG uh, contrast agent. So we know exactly where it's located within these um, tumors. So that's great. Um, if I just zoom in a little bit on the fluorescence, you can see that the, uh, the glands either do not or do contain this agent all the way up to 96 hours. So now um, that's all to be expected. Where it gets really interesting is when you start looking at some of the control uh, conditions. Uh, so the three, con the three main controls we looked at were looking at um, the blocking condition where we tried to block all the V7H3 receptors prior to injecting the V7H3 ICG and a uh, contrast agent, and then also the injection of the isotype um, uh, antibody with ICG, and then also just looking at what free ICG does um, in the animal. And these are all in mice with invasive carcinomas. So fluorescence imaging is our friend here, and you can see that um, just like in the specific antibody, you get accumulation within the mammary glands in both the blocking condition and the isotype control condition all the way up to 96 hours. Um, and this was a little surprising to us. We weren't quite ready for that. Um, ultrasound imaging, of course, shows our, uh, our tumors as expected. And, but the nice thing, the, the key result here is that our photoacoustic molecular signal using the spectroscopic algorithm is able to suppress the, the nonspecific signal because it, it doesn't match that reference spectrum that we provided it from the internalized integrated signal. And so it does that in the blocking condition and also in the isotype control condition. And I can uh, zoom in a little bit here and you can see that it's definitely within these glands. Um, and just to note that ICD only, ICD by itself um, clears very, very rapidly. So within two hours, this is gone. But it actually does have some innate ability to accumulate within um, uh, tumors as well. But the clearance is just on such a different um, time scale here, and there's no specificity to it. So if I um, quantify all of that imaging data for you, that was a lot. Um, you know, you can really, you really get the, the, the beauty of using a spectroscopic photoacoustic technique here. So in our tumor positive condition with our positive agent, you can see we get about a three-fold increase in photoacoustic molecular imaging signal as compared to before injection. Whereas if you look at the other conditions, we're not getting any statistically significant increase in molecular imaging signal. Whereas if you look at fluorescence imaging, um, you do get your your increase in like in your in ICG signal um, in your positive um, condition, but you also are getting an increase in your blocking condition and the isotype agent as well, and also even a, a slightly a statistically significant um, increase in with just free ICG. And so this really just highlights not only the specificity that you're going to get using this kind of spectroscopic technique with a, with a well-characterized reference spectrum. Um, but also it highlights the sensitivity because now um, photoacoustic imaging is on par with fluorescence imaging. So of course we wanted to, we were a little shocked that um, the isotype agents and the blocked agents still accumulate in the tumors and so of course we wanted to validate that this agent was actually being accumulated um, as well. And so we took um, uh, histology sections and used a near-infrared slide scanner to actually locate the ICG within the histological sections. Um, and you can see that uh, uh, in normal glands, the, there is no accumulation of either the isotype ICG or the V7H3 ICG as expected, but in, in, with glands that contain breast cancer, you can see there is extensive accumulation in ICG. And if you quantify that, it's here. This is not statistically significantly different, by the way. It just is what it is. Um, so definitely the ICG is there. And now we also wanted to look and see if we could um, determine whether or not the antibody portion of the agent was there, whether or not we wanted to validate that the antibody was actually reaching its target and being degraded and not just the ICG coming off earlier and just having to accumulate these tumors. So we did kind of an interesting 
interesting um, experiment here. So um, we allowed our contrast agents to circulate for 24 hours. And then we wanted to use an immunofluorescent staining technique. So now typically this technique um, works where after the tissue is collected and sectioned, you apply a primary antibody that um, targets your, your you know, marker of, of interest. And then you apply a secondary antibody to highlight where that primary antibody is located. However, in this case, we did not use a primary antibody. We allowed the injected, um, in vivo injected uh, uh, antibody ICG or isotype an um, antibody ICG to act as the primary uh, antibody. And so, um, and then just applied a secondary antibody after, um, after sectioning of the tumors. And so, it's really interesting to see this, that in normal uh, mammary glands, there's no accumulation of either an isotype antibody or a BCMH3 antibody. However, if you look at an invasive carcinoma, you not only can detect the isotype antibody, you can also detect the B7H3 antibody as well. And if you look at it, the distributions are actually a little bit different, which is very interesting. So we know that not only are the ICG um, dye molecules reaching, or reaching into the, the tumors, but also the antibody portions are as well reaching into the tumors. And so really, this just really highlights that using uh, this type of technique, this kind of spectroscopic photoacoustic imaging, gives you just strong specificity to the molecular target that you're looking at. Um, as well as increases the uh, sensitivity um, as well. So um, I'm going to wrap up here a little faster than I meant to be, but it's okay. Um, so we showed basically in the study that B7H3 is just abundantly expressed in human cancers um, and very specific uh, area of the curve of 0.93 compared to normal and benign lesion, lesion tissues. Um, we were able to synthesize these antibody ICG agents, characterize them extensively. And then through the, the kind of um, complex in vitro, in, in vivo experiment, we were able to determine the reference spectrum for this molecularly bound and degraded antibody ICG, um, and also as for an unbound nonspecific agent. And then using our knowledge there, we were able to differentiate uh, B7H3 signal in invasive carcinomas from normal glands and also from nonspecific um, antibody ICG signal. So I want to just um, acknowledge uh, the lab here at Stanford, the PI, Jurgen Willman, and our, our various funding sources. Um, and with that, I will take any of your questions. Thanks very much, Katie. That was that's a, a great, uh, great talk, great presentation. I, I know it's kind of a short time to go through uh, so much work. Um, it's kind of hard <laughs> to get across the the amount of work that went into this. Which I mean, it's it's astounding. It's it's really nice. Um, I just want to remind people that uh, yeah, we're, we'll take your questions now. Uh, just uh, type your questions into the questions box. Um, uh, and in the meantime, I've got a couple here. Um, one uh, one person says, do you, do you always use linear unmixing methods? Was blind unmixing used? Uh, if so, how accurate are they for the imaging studies explained? So in this case, uh, yes, we always use linear unmixing methods. That's fairly standard for the field. Um, um, so no, I did not use blind unmixing methods. Um, how accurate are they? Um, this This is something that's kind of being worked through a lot in the field, the people doing this, is it is hard to validate this because, first of all, uh, you can never directly correlate what you're seeing uh, in vivo uh, with what you're seeing ex vivo. Like comparing a histo you know, histology-wise um, is very, very difficult. Um, however, there are methods. Um, this general method of using linear mixing has been validated in terms of looking at things like oxygen saturation, which you can measure. Um, independently, so there is a way to measure, you know, oxygen saturation based off of, um, you know, other methods, and so to compare them, and these tend to be very accurate. So um, the question is is a good one in terms of how do we validate these sort of spectroscopic um, unmixing methods? Um, and the truth is, is you have to one, you can look at your histology. Um, 
uh, in a certain in a certain regard. And then if you're looking at something that has a, a, a other gold standard method of looking at it, you can try that as well. Um, but a finite level of accuracy may not be able to be determined. Okay, great, thanks. Um, <clears throat> I mean, sort of, sort of along those lines. I mean, you're you're using um, you know this linear method, uh, and you're saying it's, it's it can be difficult to validate things like um, you know blind unmixing and that kind of thing. The question I I get often is you know okay you're seeing a signal there you know how how kind of quantifiable is that signal? So people want to know you know how many uh, receptors for example are in that mm -hmm. area or you know how many molecules of a of a given drug or something like that. Okay, can you just comment comment on that? Yeah, so I think getting completely quantitative uh, analysis is going to be very challenging. Uh, it it really depends. You have to set up. Um, your equations perfectly. You have to know a lot of information. Um, we're making a lot of assumptions when we do this. We're assuming fluence. We're assuming you know green eyes parameter. We're assuming optical absorption co um, contrast agents. And also, um, when we're doing this, we're also using um, relative absorption spectrums. So you have to use absolute as well. So if you have uh, uh, the ability to directly um, you know, gather all that information for each pixel within your image, then theoretically you could make a quantitative assessment of of something, of a concentration of a photo absorber. However, it's all, you know, practically impossible to do that. So right now, the what is presented are relative um, values of photo absorbers that you're looking at. Um, you know, one of the new, you know, kind of one of the new things that we're looking at is using some sort of machine learning algorithm to kind of help us with these algorithms, and then that might have a potential to be more quantitative in the future. Um, but like I said, some things can be quantitative, such as looking at, um, you know, oxygen deoxygenated hemoglobin, and then using that to infer oxygen saturation. That's fairly quantitative. Uh, but looking at something like, um, you know, the number of receptors on a cell is going to be very challenging. Okay. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> a couple of questions coming in here. Are there ways uh, to know whether a dye would work well for photoacoustic imaging? Basically asking, was there a reason you chose ICG over something else? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the main, there's two main reasons we chose ICG. ICG is one, it's clinically used already for other applications. So that's, um, we always want to look towards clinical translation of everything we do. And so um, that's, that was a strong positive point to it. And then secondly, um, because ICG has these very large shifts in optical absorption, we wanted to be able to take advantage of that. But in general, when you're looking at a dye for photoacoustic imaging, um, uh, maybe if you don't want to do such a, you know, like a kind of intricate uh, method, if you just want to use a dye, Generally, what we look at is um, fluorescent dyes, and we look at fluorescent dyes with um, low quantum yields, so actually really bad fluorescent dyes, if you will. Um, but these dyes are more likely to, to go through non-radiative emission when they relax back to their ground state, so they produce heat versus the emission of a photon or fluorescing. Um, so if looking at bad fluorescent dyes is actually probably a good, good place to start if you're interested in um, you know, doing something similar. What about uh, things like nanoparticles, uh, that kind of thing? You, you mentioned sort of gold nanoparticles in the in the top of your talk. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's just been an extensive body of, of work um, looking at nanoparticles. So nanoparticles have very high um, absorption, um, more cross sections, and so they are exceptionally good at absorbing light and converting it to heat. And I think that... Um, people uh, use these nanoparticles because they have to overcome the high background signal of hemoglobin in photoacoustic imaging that you're going to have everywhere. And um, one of the ways to do that is to use nanoparticles because they have such high absorption. Um, however, um, you know, if we're looking at clinical translation, um, nanoparticles <laughs> they're they're going there slowly, <laughs> but it, if we're trying to get photoacoustics into a clinical um, uh, applications sooner, we need to look at things that are going to be that are either already clinically approved or will be very rapidly. And I just don't see the 
I'm going to, I'm going to insult somebody, <laughs> the, the nanoparticles being approved as quickly, you know, let's put it that way, as, as something that's dye-based. Um, but yeah, I mean, nanoparticles are great for in vitro and preclinical studies. Um, they have very high absorption, and so you can, and they're very, they have great, um, you know, uh, surface chemistry techniques also, so you can easily bind them to a molecular target, uh, et cetera. Uh, it's just that when we're looking towards clinical translation, we need to maybe think about something else. It, it, it actually makes a good segue for, for the next question. Um, the, the attendee says, thanks for your presentation. Do you think there will be space for clinical application for photoacoustics soon? They're, they're not more specific than that, but I think, I mean, your talk is clearly, clearly, you know, there's translational goals in mind for, you know, detection uh, and, and, and diagnosis. Um, maybe you can just elaborate that on a little bit. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I think there's a lot of really great people out there working on um, translating photoacoustics to the clinic. I think um, there are a lot of great um, potential applications. Breast cancer is a big one, and there's a, there's actually some clinical trials out there now working on looking at like two wavelength photoacoustics for looking at uh, breast lesions, etc. Um, other applications include um, skin cancers or thyroid cancers, prostate cancers being examined, ovarian cancers being examined, um, and all of these have really great clinical application because they're relatively um, superficial, like these diseases tend to be easily accessible um, superficially. Um, and then, uh, you know, I think, I think the main, one of the big holdups right now, however, is that there's just not a people are having to develop their own systems to do this. Um, and so there's not a, you know, clinic, there's not a clinic ready photoacoustic system. Well, that's not true actually. There's, there's, <laughs> um, they're just starting to come on the, on the market here. And so I think that's kind of been the big holdup but, um, between r really getting photoacoustics in the clinic. And what about the the agent itself? I mean, you, you, you mentioned that you use the ICG because it is already clinically approved. I, I don't know how, you know, you know, feel free to, you know, defer this question, but uh, I don't know how um, clear the, the translational pathway is for something like that if you are sort of, um, you know, conjugating an antibody or something like that. Yeah, you, you know I mean, it, it definitely does, it does not fast track it. I'm not, I'm, <laughs> I'm not gonna pretend that like all of a sudden this is just gonna be in the clinic tomorrow. Um, I mean, this is effectively a new contrast agent, even though it's using clinically translatable parts or components, um, you know, together, there's going to have to be a whole new round of studies. But the nice thing about this is that um, our sister modality, fluorescence, is already doing a lot of this work. So there's already a lot of antibody dye um, fluorescence contrast agents being used in clinic. And so it'd be nice to be able to piggyback on those for our photoacoustic imaging. Um, Great, yeah. Um, I just, I, I sort of have to ask, you know, this is a huge amount of work that went into this. Can you just comment on what someone who wants to do this kind of work with their own uh, molecular target, what, what, what would they need to do, uh, you know, just preclinically in this case, but, what, you know, how much of the, this work would they need to replicate? What's your sort of view on that? Um, well, the nice thing is I think that the synthesis of the agent is very straightforward um, and can be done very quickly, um, you know, within a week. <laughs> uh, the, the ICG and NHS esters are commercially available now, and then as long as you have an, an antibody or maybe, you know, an antibody fragment or peptide or whatever your targeting moiety is that's protein-based, um, you know, I think that can be accomplished very quickly. Um, uh, the next, the next component is you have to have, you know, some sort of model of your disease, and some models are very well established, like this breast cancer model, some are not, so that's another variable. And finally, um, you know, you have to make sure that what you're imaging, just like I had to do, determine a reference spectrum to use, you have to make sure that, you know, you have an appropriate reference spectrum for your application as well. And and it may be very, I you know, I'm not sure about this, but it may be very similar to what I found, or it may be something that's completely different depending on, you know, your setup and your animals and your imaging conditions, et cetera. So, um, you know, I think, it's, I think it's definitely doable relatively quickly, um, but you just have to, I think somebody would, you know, 
need to know about photoacoustics or at least have access to somebody who, who um, knows. <laughs> um, and then I think everything else is, is very straightforward. Okay. Um, I think just one last one, um, and, and I know you, you did touch on this in your talk, but some of the comparisons between, you know, fluorescence and, and photoacoustic imaging, and I wonder if you could just make some general comments, since you did use both extensively, mm -hmm. and you know, most people who are, who are doing a lot of this molecular work uh, for cancer research are already using uh, fluorescence. I was wondering if you could just do a really quick sort of, you know, com compare and contrast between the two uh, for, for this specific purpose here. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think, in general, I think both modalities definitely have their strengths and, and they both, um, you know, generally have their weaknesses. Um, so for fluorescence imaging, um, it's great. It's high throughput. You know, there's great equipment out there that you can do lots of animals at the same time. Uh, it's high sensitivity, so you're going to be able to detect very small amounts of fluorophore, um, et cetera. Um, the, the part where uh, fluorescence starts um, showing some weaknesses is, is in resolution. Um, it's just, it's just, and the deeper you go, the less resolution you get because of, because of inherent scattering within the tissue. Um, now, photoacoustics uh, is kind of the opposite. Photoacoustics has great resolution, and even at depth it has great resolution because we're looking now at an ultrasound transient coming out of the tissue versus a photon. And so the resolution aspect is based off of the ultrasound, um, you know, reconstruction configuration. So that's that's a great aspect of photoacoustics. Um, in general, photoacoustics may be a touch less sensitive uh, than than fluorescence, but using some maybe some spectroscopic tricks, you know, we may be able to overcome that. Um, and also, depending on you know dyes you use and like the amount of of, of target available for that to bind to, you know, et cetera. I think there's tricks you can play to get around some of the sensitivity limitations of photoacoustics. And I want to say that um, maybe sensitivity is not the word I'm looking for. Maybe uh, it's, it's just the high background signal. Because if you're ever working in vivo, you're going to have to overcome the hemoglobin signal, which is going to be everywhere and it's going to dominate your signal. So I think actually the two combined are very um, complementary as well. So <laughs> um, but yeah, there you go. Great. No, that, that, thank you. That's, that's, um, that's really nice. Great, great presentation. Again, tons of work. Really nice, thorough study. Um, I'm not sure if you mentioned it already, but this is published in Theranostics um, this year. What was it? Uh, volume 7, Issue 6. So, uh, again, for people listening, please look up the paper, uh, and I, I believe you'll be able to contact um, Dr. Wilson you know, through her contact info on the paper. Um, we welcome questions as well. Um, we've got a couple of announcements just to uh, just at the end here. First of all, uh, we're going to be at a Tumor Models Conference in Boston, uh, and on Wednesday, July 19th at 3:10 p.m., we're going to have a talk from Dr. Mukund Sushadri. Uh, he's a professor of oncology uh, in the Department of Pharmacology and Thera uh, Therapeutics, oral medicine, had neck surgery at Roswell Park Cancer Institute, and he's going to be speaking about vascular phenotyping of PDX models using multimodal imaging, including photoacoustics. Um, so that's one thing. If you are attending that conference, I'd, I'd uh, encourage you to uh, to check out that talk, and you can see the uh, link to the agenda uh, for the conference uh, is is on the screen there. Um, and finally, uh, we want you to save the date for uh, September 12th, um, this coming September 12th, for a, a Laser X hands-on imaging workshop. So this is uh, just before uh, WMIC 2017, which is in Philly. Um, the day before the beginning of the conference, we're going to be doing a workshop from uh, around noon to 8 p.m. Uh, we're going to have some talks. We're going to have a live imaging session uh, there. Uh, lunch and dinner and entertainment are included. Um, there's no fee to attend, so if you are already going to be in town for WMIC, it would be great to see you at this. Um, you can register um, by just contacting us uh, via our website um, and, uh, and check out uh, what, what else we have to offer on the website as well. Um, we've got our Vivo Laser X system. It's the actually next generation system uh, from what uh, Dr. Wilson used to do her work. Uh, 
so we'd invite you to to come see it and uh, and check out uh, our resources on the website. As usual, you can always contact us www.visualsonics.com. Uh, you can see uh, recordings of this webinar and also past webinars on our resources page. Uh, find us on social media, and then please uh, do visit us at our conferences. You can find a list of them on our website as well. Uh, again, thanks. Uh, Thanks so much, Katie. Great, great work, great talk, uh, and thank you everyone for attending.